and all living beings. Please send the wonderful Lama will to teach us how to live suffering and attain peace and empower and death and quickly realize number. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suje Doye Allahadi Samya Sambo Doje. say after he woke up underneath the Bodhi tree. This is our historical Buddha, the founder of the faith that we're following. And the text is not an easy one, but that's not a, that won't stop you. Uh, stuff that's easy often isn't worth doing. And in this case, the reward for taking the effort to opening these texts is to keep in our sights the story of the Bodhisattva. In bodhisattvas, we're pretty much keeping the Sanskrit to describe what this is. A bodhisattva is an awakened being. Bodhisattva is a word that's pretty much already in English. Bodhi, to awake, awakening. Sattva, a being. And beings can be in all kinds of forms. Female forms, male forms, forms of different skins, forms of different eyes, color, uh, forms with feathers and fur <laughs> and horns and scales. Uh, bodhisattvas are not limited to one particular realm or another, but that's not to say that they're strange and bizarre or somehow beyond our, our awareness at all. Um, the best example of bodhisattva-like behavior is a mother who puts her child first. Um, moms are famous for that, and uh, thank goodness. 
and that ability to be selfless and to sublimate your own comfort and needs to the needs of the infant to whom you are connected, to whom is part of you. That's what a bodhisattva does. He doesn't do it for merely one child of his own flesh and blood or her own flesh and blood. Bodhisattvas see all beings, regardless of affinity or kinship, as someone to protect and someone to teach. So that's a bodhisattva. And this concept is, is uh, not popular uh, politically. The name of the game these days is self-interest. And the bodhisattva works on the self to reduce that. That's his interest, her interest, getting rid of the self so that all beings are connected through him or her. And every action, every word, every deed is for their benefit. And the bodhisattva being a living being, his, her own benefits are forwarded at the same time. It's not some sacrifice, some I take all the pain and you get all the good. The bodhisattva's goal is to wake up, but he wants to wake up with everyone together. So that's the joy of this teaching. And it's in the, the sutra, the flower garland. It's explained most thoroughly. And we're in the heart of it. Oh, boy. The, the sutra has 40 chapters in all. And we're on the single chapter that talks about the bodhisattvas most clearly. It's famous for justifiably famous for explaining this teaching about the bodhisattva path. It's called the 10 stages chapter. We're on stage number nine, and I've been inching us through the text week by week. And wow, today, uh, as we touch the ninth stage, um, there's something very special about to happen. So with that in mind, let's jump in. And here's our text, and we're going to slide up to the, see, we're going to come back to, um, 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 let's see here, we're going to come right back to page, I skipped past it too quickly here. When we're back, we're going to be on page 74 and 75, there we go. So where are we going? We're going to the top of the text, because we're going to chant and invite Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the Flower Garland Assembly to draw near to shed some light and to bless everybody who's within hearing. And we do this with a melody. It's Chinese the way we, we do it. Thank you to Nara de Mason for that fretless tack head banjo. He's a banjo luthier here in, in Victoria, actually, down near Melbourne. So here we go. We're back on our page. 
in the 70s here. Pardon me for scrolling. It's kind of, you get kind of seasick watching a text scroll by on the screen here. All right. Um, we have found it. Now, let me give you a background before we jump in. We're going to start on page 74, the second major paragraph that goes, right there. We'll start with the Chinese just to keep us keep our feet on the bridge, because this uh, it was our teacher, Master Shenhua, who um, in 1962 came from Hong Kong, actually at the time, but China, Manchuria, to California, and began his practice of opening up the Buddha's words and explaining them to us, so that we could find out what the Buddha said, and furthermore, find out whether the Buddha could speak English. Sure enough, over the years, that was many, many decades ago, uh, Master Hua tirelessly opened these sutras and explored them every single night, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday. So compared to Shifu, Master Hua, we are pikers. We're uh, slackers here. We only do it once a week, um, but we do that, certainly. We keep that going. And so to honor that, we recite the Chinese. It's definitely a work in progress. This translation um, was already done once uh, in the 80s. And 30 years after that, we're back uh, looking into it again, um, seeing if we can't take it deeper into the, into the vocabulary of the West, into the concepts, into the the speech of contemporary English speakers. So somebody will come along behind us doing an even better job. Let's hope that is the case. So for those of you who don't speak Chinese, you can follow the, the romanization if you like, the ABCs there. If you'd like, you just listen in and, and uh, see how Mandarin sounds coming through uh, uh, other people's voices. Try it out, put it in your ear, but it's even more fun to put it in your mouth and see how it sounds quarter of the world speaks these sounds. So here we go. Ready? Fozi Pusa Zhu Di Jiu Di De Ru Shi Shan Chao Wu Ai Zhi De Ru Lai Miao Fa Zhang Suo Da Fa Shi De Yi Tuo Lo Ni Fa Tuo Lo Ni Shi Tuo Lo Ni Guang Zhao Tuo Lo Ni Shan Hui Tuoloni, Zhong Cai Tuoloni, Wei De Tuoloni, Wu Ai Man Tuoloni, Wu Bian Ji Tuoloni, Zhong Zhong Yi Tuoloni, Ru Shi Deng Bai Wan E Sheng Qi Tuoloni Man, Jie De Yuan Man, Yi Bai Wan E Sheng Qi Shan Qiao Yin Sheng, Dian Cai Man Er Yan Shuo Fa. You heard a lot of Tolonese there, didn't you? Ten of them, to be exact. English, please. Here we go. Ready? Disciples of the Buddha. Join me if you'd like to. The Bodhisattva who abides upon the ninth stage gets unobstructed wisdoms of expedient skills, gets the Tathagata's storehouse of wondrous Dharma, and becomes a great Dharma master. He, and you, that could be she, if you want to make it a female pronoun, go right ahead. He gets the Dharani of meanings, the Dharani of dharmas, the Dharani of wisdom, the Dharani of lights, the Dharani of wholesome wisdom, the Dharani of multitudes of riches, the Dharani of awesome virtue, the Dharani of gateways to non-obstruction, the Dharani of boundlessness, and the Dharani of myriad meanings. He gets the perfection of hundreds of thousands of asamkhyas, of gateways, of dharani such as these, and he proclaims the dharma using hundreds of thousands of asamkhyas, of gateways to eloquence with skillfully expedient voices. Okay, what in the world is going on here? A bodhisattva, this awakened being, is in training. He is in school, or she. Just if you want to translate that into a female pronoun, it works just fine. So it's a training academy for how to be a better bodhisattva. And on the ninth stage, this bodhisattva is almost ready to graduate. He's only got one more uh, level ahead. 
So works perfectly if you think about school, right? Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, junior high, high school, and on. Same. The ninth stage is where the bodhisattva specifically becomes a teacher. He steps into the role of teacher. What does it say? It says here, the bodhisattva who abides, who stays there, who's uh, learning here, who's enrolled in the ninth stage, gets skills, skillful, what kind? Expedient skills. What is an expedient skill? It's flexible. It works here, but if it's a different situation, it works here too. If it's a different situation, again, it works here too. That's an expedient skill. You're flexible. You can adapt. You're very adaptable at the job of teaching. And what kind? Wisdoms of expedient skill, plural, because there were 10. We just went through 10. Unobstructed wisdom, meaning what would obstruct your wisdom? Mm, alcohol substances whoa some smoke in your lungs that you lit up and held in there right drugs worse than that what's worse than drugs and alcohol to obstruct your wisdom anger big temper oh boy you turn red you turn white you turn green you turn black with emotion and anger registers in your body how can you possibly see clearly that wisdom requires if you blow up like a firecracker all the time? So that was Master Hua's teaching. Oh, Master Hua was on his disciples about getting rid of temper. Whew. Yeah, ongoing, right? The Buddha called it a poison. This bodhisattva is no longer obstructed by those things. And so he sees what the person he's teaching can hear and talks there. He sees what they like and gives it to them without limit. That's what he's trying to do, is to get them to wake up. So after that, what happens? He gets the, check it out, Tathagata's storehouse of wondrous dharma. Oh boy, that's good. I'll take it. What's the storehouse of wondrous dharma? Everything the Buddha used himself to wake up he turned over, just passed it out. The only problem is people aren't ready to, to, to take all that he wants to give. So we learn to meditate. We learn to be generous. We learn to be morally straight. We learn to be patient, vigorous. We learn to meditate deeply into samadhi. We learn wisdom. The Buddha is passing it out. Want some more? How would you like it? Here you go. And this bodhisattva gets that. And he is now a Tha Fa, sure, a great Dharma master. Oh boy, a master of Dharma. He's a teacher. She's a teacher. She can teach while cooking. She can teach while trimming bushes, right? She can teach with silence, with a raised eyebrow. This is a great Dharma master. It's not just words and books, okay? Next, what happens? The Bodhisattva gets 10 kinds of dharani. Our sutra is big on tens of things. It's called the teaching of totality. So you never get just one, you get 10 in a row. And that's one of the reasons why people are cautious about trying to lecture the Alpha Toms because they think nobody has the time for them, right? Eh, it's worth it. What's wrong with completion, right? With fullness. So what does he get? 10 dharanis. Now, I had a choice. One thing I could do would be define dharani and jump in there. But I want to get through the text, and I'm afraid if I start explaining dharani at the start, it's going to be so interesting. The hour will pass, and I won't have touched the text. So let's see how much we can get from the context. Then we'll come back once we've finished our passage. And we'll go deeply into Dharani because it's more than you think. Hmm. What does he get? He gets 10 Dharanis. Why? Ninth stage. It's part of the lesson. It's the curriculum for somebody in the school who's training to be a complete Bodhisattva. At this point, that's what you learn here. What is it? Dharani of meanings. 
He knows meanings and can convey them. The Dharani of Dharmas. He knows Dharmas, methods. He knows techniques. He knows how, right? He answers the how. Meanings would be what? What is he teaching? Dharmas is how you apply them. So it's theory and practice, right? It's principle and application. The Dharani of wisdom. We've been going through 10 kinds of eloquence, right? The passage just before this, we've been we're out for a month, 10 kinds of eloquence, and they're called wisdoms. The Dharani of lights, hmm, that's esoteric, isn't it? Lights appear throughout the sutra, breaking apart darkness, the night. The Dharani of wholesome wisdom, things that everybody warms up, their hearts warm when they hear it. The Dharani of multitudes of riches. What was the Chinese for that? Zhong cai, right? Multitudes of riches. So, is it currency? Is it dollar bills? Is it plastic? Is it uh, online, virtual, digital, digital wealth? Yeah, all of the above. But it's more important than that. It's more important than just ways of exchanging things of value. It's riches like the wealth of generosity, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of imagination, right? A wealth of kindness. Imagine all those riches that the mind, when you wake up, it has. How much, how much does imagination cost, right? What is a price tag on forgiveness? You feel you've harmed somebody, injured them, and it just takes takes over your mind. You feel so guilty. And that person comes to you face to face and says, I forgive you. I've gotten way past it. You should let it go. Don't let it eat you up. And this darkness goes away from your heart. Price? Priceless. How much does that cost? Can't buy it, right? So not all riches are or have dollar signs on it. Maybe we could suggest that he take his conversation elsewhere, maybe? Yeah. So, a Dharani of awesome virtue. What's in a Dharani of awesome virtue? Weda, this is, uh, that's our Chinglish translation. Probably virtue is enough here to make sense, but awesome gives it the quality of, mm, I want to say, you know it when you see it. My best example of somebody with awesome virtue was my high school, uh, uh, what was he? He's the vice principal, uh, Don Sharp, uh, a wonderful man, used to be uh, a wrestling coach in high school. And before that, he was a U.S. Marine uh, from the Second World War. And... Uh, uh, Vice and Principal Don Sharp had this uh, ability to be awesome before we even knew that word, right? He would walk down the hall, and it was a high school, big city public high school, 2,000 students. And every day that he showed up to work, he had a sport coat. It was spotless. He had a tie that was just perfectly tied. He had posture like a Marine and he had those eyebrows that kind of, you know, shoot up like this. And he, he would march down the hall and kids would just kind of melt into their lockers. You know, I hope you don't look at me today because I forgot to tuck in my shirt, you know, and yeah, I don't notice the cigarettes rolled under my t-shirt sleeve here. And he made you tremble, not because he was mean, but because he respected himself and carried himself in this way. You had a feeling that bullets would bounce off him. He was bulletproof. And behind it was humor. But when he had a, he had a, he, he twinkled, he absolutely twinkled. And I remember one day, uh, I, there was uh, class elections, right, for the school government. 
And uh, I was running for an office and I won this office in the school government. And walking down, the, I was coming this way after the election the next day and uh, Mr. Sharp was walking down this way. And as we crossed, he looked over to me and he went, wink, just one wink like that. And I saw it and oh, I was so pleased because I got a wink from, from Mr. Awesome, scary principal. He had a paddle in his office and the paddle had holes drilled in it. It was a wooden paddle, like a tennis racket, but it wasn't a tennis racket, it was solid wood. And this was the day before corporal punishment was, now I guess if your principal touches you, you can sue him or your parents. Those days, you went into Mr. Sharp's office and you would hear this, what were the holes drilled? It would go faster with the holes drilled in, right? Bam. So this man was so awesome that you just wanted to be like him and you wanted to be liked by him. It mattered that he respected you and it mattered that he didn't catch you doing something wrong because, oh, he would be an awesome foe. <laughs> Nobody you wanted to see scowling at you, right? So there's awesome virtue. And what was it? He was a high school vice principal. You know, he, he and his, he had a lovely wife. They were married for 40 some, 40, 50 years, I believe. And I, I remember uh, going back uh, before I went to become a monk, I went back to visit uh, Mr. Sharp and uh, saw, saw his house, modest house, in Toledo and went in to say hello to him. And he hadn't bent an inch. He was now, uh, let's see, that was 18. That was seven years later after I graduated. And he was just as, uh, not rigid, just as straight and as strong as, as he had been in my imagination, uh, seeing him in the hallway of high school. But um, he, I saw him in his own environment, and he did not xie uh, dai in Chinese, right? He didn't slack off at all. That's the way he was. That's the way he lived his life. So what awesome virtue. Who, you know, everybody listening maybe has someone in your experience who corresponds to awesome virtue. Now, the question is, and I haven't touched it yet, what is Durrani? have to do with this. Hmm. He gets the Durrani of gateways to non-obstruction. Another way to translate that might be unobstructed gateways, open doors. Mm, yeah, we'll go into that in a bit. The Durrani of boundlessness, it never reaches a fence. It keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. What is that? And finally, a simple one, zhong zhong yi, tolani, tirani of myriad meanings. Okay, now we got a conclusion. He gets the perfection of hundreds of thousands. What's an asamkhya? An asamkhya is a countless, beyond counting. No numbers go there. Hundreds of thousands of uncountable gateways, doors, of Dharani, Dharani comes in gateways because it's a method of opening, okay? And here we go, ready? He proclaims the Dharma using hundreds of thousands of asamkhyas of gateways to eloquence with skillfully expedient voices. Is he a ventriloquist? If need be, he can speak in a language you can understand in a voice that you can accept. Um, what are expedient voices? Uh, I remember in America, it was three, two, two presidential elections ago. Today, that's an auspicious day because Australia just had their federal elections. Two American presidential elections ago, the candidates were on the radio campaigning for your vote and it was, we have these endless campaign cycles in America, months and months, nine, a year out. They're out there telling you to vote for them. 
And I remember listening to, I, I'm a listener of public radio when I'm driving to keep myself awake up and down Highway 101 in Northern California. And the, uh, a candidate who I did not appreciate, I won't name him, came on the radio and was promising things. And I remember hearing in his voice dishonesty. He didn't mean it. He was saying words that had no meaning value in them. It was simply the language that he was, that his handlers had given him that day, assuming that 49.5% of the people would approve. Uh, and I, it, the, the voice was so un expedient, inexpedient, and unskillful for me as an audience, I just, I remember shouting at the radio. <laughs> Monks aren't supposed to shout at radios, especially not when you're driving down the freeway. But I was like, you're lying to me. Don't do that. You know, it, his, the, the voice, the, the content, I knew the content. It was not genuine. It didn't matter things he was saying. But it was the duplicitousness evident in his voice that just pressed my button. And I would not have voted for that candidate until he went to his room and sat in the corner and thought about being stopping lying. He was lying, he was not telling the truth. Followed by, followed by another candidate. And this candidate, again, I won't name him. Uh, he was very much to my liking Interestingly, he came from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, which will give people a clue who remember, um, which is not, maybe might've been, I liked his voice because I recognized it as an Ohio voice, maybe. But he was also a vegan, that narrows them down. How many presidential candidates are vegans, right? A good hearted man. And he was saying such things as, and I'll, I'll imitate his voice in the way he was saying it. He was being interviewed by Michael Krasny, our, our favorite, uh, radio talk show host in the Bay Area, Michael Krasny said, and well, tell us about this, this new initiative you have, candidate, uh, 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 representative. And he said, well, honestly, I think all the money that we spend to destroy lives and to tear bodies apart would be better used to benefit people and to bring well-being. So I'm going to propose and commit myself to creating a new department in the American government called the Department of Peace. Are you with me on that? He said. And my heart opened as I was, I was like, yes, can we vote for him? Can my vote twice? Oh, it was his voice had no trace of falseness. He was speaking from his heart because he cared about it and it made sense. It was, let's stop destroying people. Let's start helping people. Like, yeah, yeah. Thank you for being a civic leader in that direction. So can you imagine how the Bodhisattva speaks? Can you imagine, right? Skillfully expedient voices, whatever representative, I won't mention his name, had, it came out in his voice and he was believable. That's called integrity, right? So, and the other voice was so inexpedient and unskillful because it brought out of me this strong reaction, aversion to, I can hear it. The, just there was no honesty in it. It was designed to manipulate me into thinking this character was likable, right? Not. Unfortunately, guess who won? Uh, what about Dharani's? We're back to Dharani's. Uh-huh. Obviously, Dharani's have to do with sound. What is it? Okay. We've looked at our, our uh, passage. Now, I'm going to bring up, is this the, the document here? Uh, not this one. No. Nope. I need to bring up my note notes got it right here 
Here it is. Now, this is the word. I'll explain. I know you don't have it there, Sam. Uh, it's zhong chi. Chinese, let's see, I want the English. So, there we go. It's Z-O-N-G, third tone, C-H-I, second tone, Zong Chi. And what do they say about that? Zong means to, to summarize, to um, gather and essential, to make essential, to gather the essence. How about that? To gather the essence. Oh, one more time. There we go. To gather the essence and chi to hold on to, to grasp. Okay? So what is a dharani? Traditionally, a dharani, Sanskrit, that's not an English word. I don't know how long it'll be before that's an English word. A dharani the Chinese, they say, zong yi qie fa shi wu liang yi. That's the second phrase I've got here. And it says, a dharani summarizes all dharmas, lower D, lowercase, D-H-A-R-M-A, and holds on to limitless meanings. Okay, now where have we run into the word Dharani? Anybody who has ever recited the Great Compassion Mantra knows there is what's called the Great Compassion Dharani, right? Tabe Toloni. It's a mantra. What's a mantra? A mantra is a sound that is recited not for meaning, but for its vibration power. The efficacy, the use of a mantra is the vibrations that it makes, the waves, the ripples that it sends out, not specifically for the meaning. A mantra could, some people call it a spell, right? bibbidi bobbidi boo was that, what was that? Was that, it was Walt Disney. Bibbidi bobbidi boo. Snow White? Might have been Snow White. Uh, Cinderella, Cinderella. There we go. Thanks. Listen, I'm glad you guys, I was just testing, just seeing if you're listening. And they were. Cinderella. Um, okay, I got one for you. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Come on, you were quick with your citations there. Again, no, a different author. That was J. Frank Baum, an older author. Anybody? A little louder? Hocus Pocus, Dominocus? No, Double Double Toil and Trouble is a kind of a mantra, but it's probably a Shia mantra. It's from Macbeth, Shakespeare, right? Okay, check it out. There we go. Indeed, that's a, a witch's spell in Shakespeare, the weird sisters. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Unfortunately, that's all I know from it. Probably a good thing, because I don't want to you say it enough times, you can invoke the power behind it, probably. So, mantras, spells, what's the difference? Hmm, intention, for sure. But the Buddha passes on mantras and dharanis, and something that we don't have a good English word for, a good, uh, it's called janyan, true words. Chinglish, janyan, true words. So when you say mantras, some of them are dharanis, which summarize all dharmas and hold limitless meanings. Some of them are mantras, 
which is different from a dharani, and some are true words, which is different from a dharani and a mantra. What's the difference? Mm, they're just passed on. Some are called jenyan, some are called zhou, some are called toloni in Chinese. If you say mantra, you won't be wrong. You may not be specifically right, but we in our Chinese Mahayana keep alive mantrayana, the vehicle of mantras. We start every morning with the great, with the Sharangama mantra. Fifteen minutes. If you go, Namo Sarando Sujedo Ye Allaho De Samyal Sambudo She Namo Sarando. Fifteen minutes at that speed. It's a long, long. Dharani, but it's called the Lungyen Cho, the Shurangama Mantra. Every day at lunch, we do the uh, Ganlu, uh, Ganlu Zhenyan, right? Uh, we do the Pu Gongyang Zhenyan, true words, uh, not mantras, not Dharanis. So, um, what about our Bodhisattva? Is that what's being talked about here? Now, yes and no, both. In the Theravada tradition, the Pali-based tradition, they have what are called parita, and parita are these wonderful chants for protection, for peace of mind, for dispelling noxious vapors and bad chi, for beckoning in auspicious energy and good luck. There are parita chants uh, that are there to help women in childbirth. Famous story of Angulimala, the serial killer, who the Buddha transformed, tamed, and Angulimala completely turned around from his prior uh, habits and became a bestower of well-being on mothers in childbirth. And many, many, many places in Thailand absolutely want someone to recite Angulimala's Parita before they give birth, because it works. It ensures the mother survives and the baby is healthy. Um, more, what else? Um, there is the uh, famous Metta Sutta, right? And uh, that's, a, that's not a, a parita, but it's used as a parita to bring good luck. So it's, it's a function of a dharani. Okay, so we've established that Buddhism is uh, full of dharani. I was doing some homework before this lecture and discovered, actually we looked at it last night in our lecture here at the Gold Coast, that some of the earliest, earliest printed books ever, ever were spells, were dharanis. The belief was that if you have this, these sounds and you print them out, carry them on your person, put them over your door, keep them on your altar at home, good luck results. The earliest printed books before the Gutenberg Bible, before Sir Francis Bacon, uh, there were, in the Tang Dynasty, which is the, the beginning in the seventh century, there were mantras and dharanis printed out. So they took characters, Chinese characters, to match the Sanskrit syllables, often printed in Siddham, which is this other uh, Buddhist language, printed language, from India. And uh, the uh, allowed goodness to come into the lives of people who uh, were lucky enough to print it out. So how about that? Chinese science, right? Chinese technology. The earliest examples of printing. So uh, Dharani, wow, it's a deep thing. It's, there's all this Dharani literature. Fundamentally, it's about sound. Okay, so far so good. Mantras, Dharanis, vibrations, sound, printed books, good luck, all that. That's not all. And this is why I'm so excited 
about this chunk of text and why I've been waiting to get to this for everybody is because my first clue came to what is going on here, came also from the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And Manjushri Bodhisattva at the beginning of the Sutra comes down to teach. And Shariputra, who in the Sutra appears as the teacher of young monks, greatly wise Shariputra, another disciple, is bringing his uh, was it 1600 uh, monks down to meet Manjushri and he's telling these trainees, these are novices and he's telling them about the incredible good fortune they have to meet this amazing teacher, Manjushri Bodhisattva. And Manjushri shows up, the young monks see him and suddenly it says these future bodhisattvas attain qualities that they didn't have before they saw Manjushri. The very sight of this bodhisattva who is sitting over there on the altar, by the way. Want to see him? Let's take a look at Manjushri. There he is down there. How about that? We're looking at Samantabhadra and Vairochana Buddha. The young monks see Manjushri, and what happens? It says, get fa yan jing. Their dharma vision gets purified, meaning opens. Furthermore, they get wu ai bian sai, limitless eloquence, and they get toloni, among other things. So I heard that, and I was thinking, um, they get mantras? No, it's not that. It's that what? Like our Bodhisattva on the ninth stage, who just got 10 kinds of Dharani, what's going on here is in our human Buddha nature, in our wisdom nature, we have a potential for wisdom called Dharani. It's a potential meaning, it's a wiring, it's a functioning that's there waiting to be activated, waiting to be fired up. At the ninth stage, the bodhisattva is ready for it to be fired up. And when it happens, he can teach like nobody's business. He can teach as never before. Now, the preparation for this to happen in the ninth stage has been what? He's been activating all kinds of wisdom and doing all kinds of talking, 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 four kinds of eloquence. They're not called eloquence, they're called wisdoms, but they're eloquences, right? Eloquence of meaning, eloquence of dharma, eloquence of phrasing, eloquence of joy of speech. So he's been she's been having all these things happen now and now the bodhisattva gets the tathagata's treasury of dharma and becomes a dafasher and dharani kicks in okay so from here to the rest of the chapter we're going to find out what that allows the bodhisattva to do We like noise. Um, so why do I think that? It's because what happens next? What happens next in our bodhisattva's career as a teacher is pretty much inconceivable, pretty much amazing, all right? Now, what, when, when have you been in a situation that you needed people to listen to you and do what you say. Maybe you're a mom and it was your kids. Maybe you're a boss and it was your employees. 
maybe it was you're a traffic guard at this at the intersection and you want the kids to not run in front of the traffic so you have to they have to believe in you right maybe you're a dharma master you're trying to uh to make a point you're trying to help people wake up maybe you're a salesperson and you're trying to sell your product to a company and it's an unknown you've got a whole new concept and you have to if they go for it you can ipo and everybody gets rich right maybe you're in these situations where you depend upon your speech more important though is you depend upon the light of your virtue behind your words like my radio interviews with the political candidates one to my mind to my ears lacked the integrity to make me accept that his words came from a straight intention the other one had that light and i believed what he said then it was radio i couldn't see their faces i was only judging by the power of their voice and the words it was what was behind the words that made the difference okay so our bodhisattva has been putting in the hours days weeks months years of personal cultivation and working on the self getting rid of that ego in the middle so now when we hear his words it's like oh my goodness i'm moved i want to change my way of thinking and move towards that way of thinking i agree i'm touched i'll go for it right so this is the power of dharani and it's not a mantra it's dharani does mean mantras but okay i'm going to go back here for a sec preview plug in mantra for this word he gets the mantra of meanings the mantra of dharmas the mantra of wisdom the mantra of lights the mantra of wholesome it doesn't no nah. he's getting a transformation of his nature that is there because he's going to be a teacher it's a function and i want to make this point really clearly um the bodhisattva also has things called uh, psychic powers shantong in chinese right and they're superhuman superhuman abilities and the bodhisattva can hear and see things beyond our knowledge past lives you can see what you're thinking right this minute <gasps> right uh oh the bodhisattva with psychic powers can know the past can know the future all these things and these abilities have been fictionalized they've been put into movies plays novels stories puppet shows so this particularly spiritual function has filtered down into popular culture in asia not so much in america we tend to look suspiciously on people who can do things that science can't explain but in asia where buddhism has been for thousands of years people are very interested in the ability to know the future or know what you're thinking and they pretend to have these powers themselves without doing the work behind them who does so there are stockbrokers in taiwan who advertise that they have tianyan they have the deva vision they know what stock will be hot and which ones to sell there are realtors who will tell you they know the future they can read your thoughts and they know which property to buy to get you rich 
so that the door is just right and the kitchen is in the right place. This is the one. I see you here being rich by this property, right? There are psychotherapists who make their living telling you that they have the ability, doctors, particularly unscrupulous docs. So it's much abused, this ability to have shantong. And what's the difference between a bodhisattva's genuine psychic abilities and a commercial huckster, flim flam man or woman who makes the claim but is trading on your ignorance for your money? So you will hire them to do the service that you want. The difference is these abilities, dharani, this circuitry in our bodies and minds to be a great Dharma master and know what to say with multiple voices so that you understand and accept it. That ability and real shantong, the bodhisattva shant psychic abilities open when the bodhisattva in training needs them to teach. The shantong come in and the fourth stage. The bodhisattva has made a vow and he has said, um, I would give up my body and life if I could understand a single sentence of Dharma that would help this person break through their attachments and get liberated from their suffering. Take my arms, take my legs, take my head. I want to learn one single sentence of Dharma that I can explain to others so they wake up. I don't care. For him, getting others awake is the goal at any cost to his own well-being, right? Just like a mom. She gets up at three in the morning when the baby's crying because the baby's got colic. Mom's going to help the baby get through it. Doesn't matter. She'll sacrifice her sleep, right? Bodhisattva is the same. Okay. At that point, psychic abilities arise. It's a natural function once compassion kicks in. Without the compassion, no psychic powers. Where does the compassion come from? Selflessness. No benefit to him other than getting his, her vows accomplished quicker. Look at Dharani. Why has this manifested in the ninth stage? It's because our bodhisattva has been learning how to teach, how people can hear, how they understand, what they like to know. And he'll teach it to them. He'll teach the Dharma to them that way. And Dharani opens up this ability. So I don't know if that makes sense. I was sitting at lunch the other day and listening. And before, I don't know if you all have eaten in the monastery recently, but before we, we go to lunch, we go, Gong Yang, Ching Jing. Now we render these offerings to the pure Dharma body, Vairochana Buddha, to the perfect reward body, Nishyanda Buddha, to the myriad transformation body, Shakyamuni Buddha, to Manjushri, great wisdom bodhisattva, to universal worthy, great conduct bodhisattva, to Guan Shriyin, to earth treasury king, great vows bodhisattva, to Maha, to all bodhisattvas, Maha sattvas, Maha Prajna Paramita. And I went, click. What did we just do? We praised Buddhas. We invoked Bodhisattvas. And then we said Maha Prajna Paramita too. Now, my ear is particularly tuned to that. Why? We're explaining the Maha Prajna Paramita Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, every Friday. Friday in California, Saturday in Australia. What is it? What is Mahaprajna Paramita? Mahaprajna Paramita, if I'm understanding it correctly, is like Dharani. It's a function, latent, waiting in my mind, your mind, everybody's mind, to be activated when needed through meditation. What is it? It's the ability 
to see through the surface to the emptiness at the heart of everything at the same time without leaving the world of duality. What do you see when you when this function arises? You see that all things in the world are like dreams, like illusions, like bubbles on a stream, like shadows, like echoes, like dewdrops, and like a flash of lightning. Everything, everything, including your own body, including the world, they're just like that. And you know what? You don't leave. Seeing that it's entirely empty and like an illusion, you stick around to teach because people who you care about don't understand that and are stuck in the middle of the pain of clinging, going down for the count one more time, right? People hurt a lot and the Bodhisattva wants them to get to that place where they understand that all conditioned things Ru Meng Huan Pao Ying Lu Yi Ru Dian Ying So Ru Shi Guan. When you get Prajna Paramita, you understand the way the Buddha wants us to get to that all things made of other things, which is everything, all things made of pieces, are just like a dream. Seems so real, wake up, it's over. Right? Like an illusion. It's there in front of you, the highway is shimmering in the hot day and you drive and you never get to the shimmer. Where did that sh water on the highway go to? It's an illusion, right? It's like a bubble on a, on a bubble of foam on the stream, pop, it's gone, right? All things, all things are like that, says the Buddha. Contemplate them this way. Are they really? No, it's really, you know, really there. This is really my guitar tuner. I need it when I want to tune my guitar, but it's not real. The thing watching it is not real and long-lasting and permanent. So the Buddha says, yeah, can you wake up to that? Good, my job is done. Excellent. Prajna Paramita pops into, transforms the awareness of the Bodhisattva when needed after his precepts and concentration take him to that place. Precepts, concentration, and wisdom. So that was at lunch. I had that. Oh, my goodness, look at that. Why do we praise Prajna Paramita? Because it's a real state at a certain time. And it's there. Before you're ready, you're not going to see the emptiness of things. And you can't pretend it. Don't, don't fake it. Right? It's still real for you. Bodhisattva has both levels of wisdom functioning. The, dual, the world of duality, totally there, understanding better than ever. But the ultimate emptiness of all things is also there, which he doesn't cling to. He lets that go as well. Dharani is there for the Bodhisattva when needed to help people wake up. Okay, Jin Chuan, what do you think? Is that hold water? Is that analysis useful or helpful? What was your thought when you heard that? Yeah, about yeah, either one, but just this, first of all, Dharani, I'm out on a limb. I mean, saying that Dharani here is not a mantra. It's a state. And it's a system. It's a circuitry waiting to be activated the same way that Prajna Paramita is. What do you think about that? Right.
Right. Okay. Interesting thing about it as a state. I haven't really thought about it as a state before. That's why it's kind of a new, new idea. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, go ahead. Just actually in the Dharani Sutra, I remember the on the Great Compassion Mantra. I remember there's those ten hearts. They say the ten hearts of the Great Compassion Mantra, and it says this is the Great Compassion Mantra. The unconditioned mind, the you know, the great compassionate mind. So, in fact, it's in that sutra it says it is a state, it or it's a it's the being, and then the mantra is somehow just the expression of that in sound, maybe. It's just a reflection. Yeah, good. So, um, it's in, so Jin Chuan. Now I know not everybody here could could hear. We we're uh, we've got a, a room full of friends listening here and. He pointed to the Lotus Sutra. There's a chapter called the Dharani chapter of the Lotus Sutra, which has spells too. And he says that this is going to require more thought. But um, there's another sutra that Master Hua explained called the Dharani Sutra, which focuses on the Great Compassion Mantra. And there are ten shin, ten attitudes, ten my, uh, you know, mental states, uh, states of being that produce the Great Compassion Mantra. So, what do we know? So, thanks for those thoughts. Let's let's open. Uh, you know, when you, if you uh, if your software isn't working, you open a case with customer service, right? You write an email, and they they open a case, and and they may refund your money, or they may give you instructions or something. We're going to open a case for what is going on with Dharani and we'll keep it open for the next three or four weeks until we actually finish the ninth stage. Here's what I th think, here's what we know so far, okay, our evidence. It's number one, it's based on sound. No matter whether Dharani is mantras, Nammo Sadan Do Suche Do Ye, right? Nammo Haladan No Do La Ye Ye. It's sound. What is sound? Sound is vibration. So mantras are sound and vibration. We know um, in the beginning of the Sharangama, Venerable Ananda gets waylaid by the Xian Fan Tian Zhou. He gets, he gets seduced by the ancient mantra from the Brahma heavens that Matangi and her daughter um, know and recite. So that's a xie zhou, a, 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 a wrong dharani. There's a dharani which will confuse you, right? So double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldrons bubble. Those are, that's the witch's mantra from Macbeth. I think it's the opening scene, if I'm not mistaken. And so there can be negative vibrations, true. We know that. Now, what I'm maintaining and the next piece of evidence that I want to put out and let us uh, reflect upon as we proceed into our text is that our bodhisattva is involved in sound here. But with the ability of Dharani, this function. So if, if you, Jinchuan, if you want to pass this on, say, Hung Shur is saying that Dharani is more than a mantra, it's a, it also is a function. When that function opens up in the bodhisattva's cognitive skills, when he's got this expedient skill, he's eloquent like never before, but we're going to find out in the very next sentence coming up that he can hear the Dharma in a way that allows him to never forget anything. So his memory is activated. Then, this is a preview of coming attractions, the Bodhisattva is able to come in front of an audience of countless beings. Each of these beings, let's say they're students of the, of the Bodhisattva, throw challenges at him. Ask him their biggest knot of confusion. And the Bodhisattva goes, ah, 
And that single sound, because his function is opened up, answers all their questions and brings them to a place of delight, scattering their doubts. Poof. It's like, oh yeah. Every lecturer in the world just heaves a sigh. I wish I had that ability, right? Every teacher, every mom, I wish I could do that and my kids would listen to me. So how amazing this function starts to work and the great Dharma master teaches like never before. And there's a phrase, we have another phrase here that Sam won't, you won't get this on your, on your uh, laptop, but it's uh, for e e in e n r shuo fa zhong sheng sui lei ge de jie. The Buddha speaks Dharma with but a single sound and all living beings understand it differently, each according to their species. What's that? Dharani. Right there. Fu yi yi yin er shuo fa zhong sheng sui lei ge de jie. Let's see if we can't quickly get that up here. All right. For E. Somebody correct me if I get it wrong here. Chances are E in in try again. In R R R R Shuo Fa Shuo Fa comma Chung Sheng Chung Sheng Sui Lei. Hey. Sui Lei. Lei Lei Lei. Where's Lei? Good. Do Jie. Good. Do. Do Do Jie. Okay. There's the Chinese for it. The Buddha speaks the Dharma with only a single sound, but living beings each understand it differently, differently according to their species. So the Buddha is a major linguist. Mm. Probably breaks the record for Wikipedia number of languages spoken. The Buddha speaks bird. The Buddha speaks fruit bat. The Buddha speaks whale. The Buddha speaks ghost, right? The Buddha speaks sign language. He can talk with lights. So the devas in the Suyama heaven get it. And the Buddha speaks English. Accented for Scotland, accented for Melbourne, accented for Dallas, Texas, a single sound, and yet he's only going, ah, and everybody gets it. What is that? Science fiction? Nope. It's my mind, purified and cultivated according to Dharma methods. The Buddha discovered it. He's not selling books. He's not writing science fiction, right? The Buddha discovered it, just like Prajnaparamita. He just discovered it, and he's passing it on. It happened to him in his own mind and body, and he's saying, yep, yeah, it's all there. It's latent, hardwired, baked in. Just cultivate, and you can do it too, but you have to make the vows. You have to pay your dues, do the work, and then it functions. I mean, it's not working for you yet? Oh, maybe you didn't meditate long enough before you got up. The Buddha speaks the Dharma with only a single sound, but living beings each understand it differently according to their species. How about that? Anyway, this is the theory I'm working on. So we can take out a case and see if, uh, if customer service will refund or maybe pass this up to their supervisor before they make a decision. All righty. Uh, let's see here. I wanted to share something um, we got. Yeah, here we go. We uh, 
had a lot of snakes show up yesterday. I don't want to advertise that. Nobody will ever come if we... Boy, come to Australia and look at the snakes. No, that's not what you come to Australia for. Um, here's a nice photo. This was taken off my deck. This is the Buddha meditating in a rainy forest. Isn't that lovely? That was last Thursday, today being Saturday. Indeed. And the ambient sounds in the Queensland bush are just probably what heaven sounds like, right? Happy birds and never mind the motorcycles. There are probably fewer motorcycles in heaven, but all the same. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm not finding what I was looking for here. Okay, I won't waste your time. But we've had some uh, lovely uh, weather, some autumn weather here. And um, Jin Chuan, do you want to say anything? You want to make announcements about what's going on in Berkeley coming up? We're into the semester break. Marty's uh, six patriarch class is over and won't kick in until September again. What else have you got going on that people need to know about? Okay, so we have quite a lot going on. Um, tomorrow we have uh, the family program, our children's program here at Berkeley Monastery. Uh, the last one was well received, very fun and, and energetic, and lots of people kind of came and had fun making sushi, uh, making uh, spring rolls and calligraphy and stories. And so if people are interested, it's 1 to 3 p.m. Um, tomorrow, Sunday, 1 to 3 p.m. And the plan is to do it once a month. Um, ideally on a, a third Sunday of the month. So people can stay tuned for that. Following that, we have um, next week um, the bathing Buddha, bathing Buddha, Buddha's birthday, where we bathe the Buddha. That's going to be Saturday morning here at Berkeley Monastery. Ching Fo Shu, will that start at 9 a.m. or 8.30 or 9? Jo Din, so we'll start at 9 a.m. if you would like to bathe the Buddha here at Berkeley Monastery. We just did it at uh, CDTB, but um, if you haven't, didn't get a chance, you can also do it at Berkeley Monastery. And that's going to jumpstart our uh, three-day Amitabha session. Um, kind of open our Amitabha session for three days over Memorial Weekend. On the Sunday, we'll also do the eight precepts, transmit the eight precepts. So if people are interested, um, please... So the eight precepts will be uh, starting at 8 a.m. in the morning. And then our Dharma assembly on Monday will, I think, start at 8 a.m. as well. So if people are interested, please um, come. If you want to set up a pieway, come to the monastery and, and ask, and we can help you set something up. Um, following that, uh, June 15th and 16th, we have the, the BBM family camp. Dharma Master Mingguang from Taiwan will be coming. And it's a kind of a joining. It's, it's kind of joined forces with our family program um, here at as well, so we'll have a, a way that after you come to that event, there'll be ongoing family events that you can participate in. Um, we have Buddha, uh, the Sunna Center retreat, which still has some space, so please sign up if you're interested. The One of the focuses will be actually on kindness, and um, we're just talking tonight about meanings, also looking at the Buddha's teaching on kind of his underlying meaning of his teachings in a very famous text called the Samdhi Nirmo Chana Sutra. Um, and then, what's what else? We have the the oh the Global Buddhist Conference right after that in June. Then we have the Buddha Root Farm, and then we have the Guanin session, and then uh, the school semester should be starting very soon. So that's that's kind of our upcoming summer plans if people are interested in participating. You might mention also that um, the Buddhist composer from Malaysia, Imi Ui, uh, is coming with her musicians, with her team, to uh, the Global Buddhist Conference. People have been listening to her uh, performances and rec records for decades, and this will be her first trip to America. So anybody who, if the way to get there, to, to find out more about it, go to GBC... 
19, no, 11, gbc11.org, right? Is that correct? Does that? This dot org, or something like that. If you type in Global Buddhist Conference UC Berkeley, it'll pop up in Google. Okay. We had some loud noises here. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Org. Uh, org. And then, so, but if, if people ch Google Global Buddhist Conference Berkeley, it'll, it'll for sure come up. Yeah, yeah. So, good. Okay. Um, before we transfer the merit, uh, we know that uh, uh, Jerry's nephew is in intensive care and could use some merit transferred to get through the crisis. Um, we have been paying a lot of attention to uh, the climate change changes, climate uh, disruption going on, and uh, we need to be very kind to our neighbors in the years ahead. Um, rising ocean levels are going to force evacuation for millions of people. So we need to, to learn to be selfless and learn to share what we have. Okay, dedicate merit as you see fit, please, but just do make a dedication, send your goodness out to the world. And we do it with the melody. Please join us, here we go. of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds away to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward, may all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. All right, thank you all for joining, and may your wisdom bring you the answer to the search for dharani, and may we all become great dharma masters. Uh, how many people listening? Cliff from, from China. 26, okay. Uh, Locke, how many do we have listening? 44, great, okay, lovely. Okay, I'll meet you for everybody. Bye-bye.